All right. Good morning, church. Yeah, my name is Vaughn, and I'm a covenant partner here in GCC, and it's my tremendous joy and privilege just to be able to stand here in front of you and open us up with God's word today. And yeah, um, we're still in our series called The Conquest for Rest, where we're, we're taking a 40,000 feet overview of what the Bible has to say about the Sabbath and about um, rest from the Old Testament up to the New Testament. Just to do a bit of a recap, for, for, because we have guests, um, and we have guests actually from the Philippines right there. So or, or for some of you who has not been with us um, in the past few weeks, just to help you um, get a bit uh, updated on, on what's, what's been going on in the sermon series. So in the first sermon, um, Andy helped us to understand what's rest in creation. And we learned how God set an example for humans of just how it is to, to work and uh, to stop and to delight. And we learned how this earthly rest that we have points out to a greater reality of, of rest, um, the eternal rest which we will have with God in the new creation. In the second sermon, we learned that Sabbath means resting in God's um, sovereign goodness, power, and provision. Um, Dr. Mooney helped us understand that Sabbath for the Christian is resting in God's goodness, power, provision, and promise in Jesus Christ. And just last week, Andy preached to us about the Sabbath still, um, going from Psalms, uh, Psalm 95 to Hebrews uh, 3 and then to Mark 2, where he talked about um, that Sabbath is actually entering and enjoying rest through the work of Christ. And he preached to us the truth that Jesus Christ paid the price, completed the work of salvation, and we are now called to trust and rest in Christ's finished work on our behalf. And this morning, from that high overview of the Bible, bear with me because we're going to be zooming in to one text where we hear Jesus himself, the Lord of the Sabbath, and inviting us to come and enter his rest, to come and find rest for our souls. Let me read to you our passage this morning, which comes from Matthew 11, verses 28 to 30. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning, not in a position of strength, but in a position of need. Many of us here would resonate how wearisome and how burdensome life on earth can be. And we ask, Lord, that you would come and speak to us and do what only you can do, and that is to give rest to our souls. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would come and as we hear from your very words, Would you speak to us and help us find rest in you? Would you send your spirit so that we can hear from you and experience the reality of this rest, this very moment, today by your grace? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. So let me ask you, well, what's, the, what's the best party invitation have you ever received? Because today we're, we're hearing of Christ's invitation for us to come, right? Let me tell you a story. Now, I vividly remember one afternoon, as I was too caught up with work, you know, just busy, just uh, doing my stuff, all of a sudden I heard my phone ring and I picked it up and I heard a man's voice who says, Mr. Asuncion, with a very weird Spanish-like accent, 
I know he's, he's just trying to mimic. And just hearing that first um, uh, word from him, I knew who it was. And who could this guy be? It was Yiken. <laughs> yeah. He was inviting me over to his wedding celebration, his and Emily's wedding celebration. And it's just, I thought, how sweet of that. You know, um, at that moment when I was too busy and just, just tired and, and, get, and caught up with work, his invitation came as a delight to me. All of a sudden, I was looking forward to something better, something, you know, something grand, and, and, um, and I was looking forward to their upcoming celebration in the next couple of weeks. And I tell you, it was the best wedding celebration I've ever seen in Malaysia. For it was the first one. <laughs> now, <laughs> so if an invitation like this has the capacity to, do, to bring even just the slightest bliss in the midst of my busy day and make me look forward to it, I wonder how much greater the joy that this invitation of Christ would bring to a soul who is weary, who is burdened and just yearning for rest. And let me tell you, Christ has a much greater invitation for all of us this morning. He invites us to rest in Him. And if you would come, you would be invited to the greatest heavenly feast as pictured in Revelation 19, the marriage supper of the Lamb. So, in light of this invitation, we have three questions to ask. Who is invited? What are we being invited to? And how can we come? Again, who's invited? What are we being invited to? And how can we come? So who's invited? Well, again, let me ask you, if you're ever going to throw a party, who would be the first one in your list? What kind of people are they going to be? Well, for Jesus, he invites the poor, heavy-laden people. Imagine with me for a second a radically compassionate boss who's organized a special company retreat for his employees. But he invites not the top performers, but the low performers, the ones who are just overburdened, you know, just to give them rest. Imagine what would be the reaction of those who are doing well and doing their job and performing well. They would be furious and angry, right? Like, this can't be. I'm doing my best here, boss. Don't you see my efforts for you? And then imagine also the response of, of those who are just burdened. Oh, finally. Or some, maybe those who are being invited, those who are low performing, would just find themselves, this can't be. It's just too good to be true. Why are you rewarding me? I'm not performing well for you. You get the idea. You get the picture. In some sense, those are the kind, this is the kind of dynamics um, going on in our passage in Matthew 11. Just in the earlier, earlier verses, Jesus has renounced unrepentant cities who refuse to accept him despite the many miracles that they saw. Then he praised the Father for hiding himself from the wise, the understanding, people who think they, they had it, and thanked him for revealing himself, his gracious will of revealing himself to little children, to the poor and needy. He then said, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, in verse 28. Jesus is ex extending the sweetest invitation of all who labor, uh, uh, for all who labor and to those who are heavy laden to come to him. It's hard to miss the scope of this. It says, he says, all, all of you. Before we can taste the sweetness of this invitation, we must first realize our need to, for it. Are we part of those whom he says, all? Are you weary? Are you burdened? And to get a better understanding of who these people are or what kind of people Christ is inviting, let's first notice those who labor. Those who labor are, are the ones who are actively working for righteousness, who are actively working for salvation. 
Then there are those who are heavy laden, who are passively bearing the burden, carrying the burden of guilt, sin of, of not measuring up. And these are the ones being invited by Jesus to come to him. One preacher said, it is to these the Savior addresses his loving admonition. And in fact, he tells them, this is not the way to rest. Your self-imposed labors will end in disappointment. Seize in your wearisome exertions and believe in me, for I will at once give you rest, the rest which my labors have earned for believers. The preacher went on to say very quickly, those who are anxiously and self-righteously working for salvation fall fall into the passive state of being burdened. Their labor itself, he says, becomes a burden to them. Besides the burden of their self-righteous labor, there comes upon them the awful, tremendous, crushing burden of past sin and a sense of the wrath of God, which is due to that sin, a soul which has to bear the load of its own sin and the load of divine wrath, and indeed is heavy laden. Now, my wife and I love to stroll around KL uh, and just go through the city. Miles loves to take pictures and take videos of interesting things to see around. And as we go jalan jalan, as we stroll around, um, it's hard to miss the big temples, places of worship from different religions, right? And it's amazing how diverse the religious landscape in Kale is. And despite the, the beautiful colors, as I look at the people, I can't help but wonder, are they not being bogged down with religious rituals, tirelessly needing to keep and, um, and observe prescribed patterns and rhythms of ritualistic chants, prayers, mantras, doing charity, pilgrimage, all of those stuff. Like, can any of these things take away the burden of guilt, shame and the fear of judgment, an awful sense of the wrath of God weighing down one soul? If you're here visiting us for the first time this morning, if you resonate with what I just described, you're just tired of the many things. You're just try, tired of striving. Know that Christ's heart is drawn out to you and is inviting you. Come to me and I will give you rest. Let me also be quick to point out that we as Christians are not exempt to this kind of striving that we just talked about. We are also prone to falling to the same trap of religiosity. We also overburden ourselves, and we can be restless and be caught up in our legalistic pursuit of acceptance, the approval of men. Many times our striving is not for the approval of God because we know we can never get the approval of God based on our own merit. Hey, we're we're a Reformed church. We got our theology right, right? But most of the time, it's not true here on this level. We also overburden ourselves, and we try to actively cover up our sins with any form of good deeds or religiosity as it, it absolves us in any way. On the other hand, sometimes, more often than not, we just passively deny or minimize our sins and our need for forgiveness. Therefore, we don't come to Christ for forgiveness. This is awful when it happens because we are bearing ourselves from the only relief that we can ever have. As one preacher said, the only remedy to real guilt is real forgiveness. And it's only through Christ that we can find it. By not coming to Christ in repentance, our restlessness increases all the more and we deprive ourselves of the forgiveness and rest that our Lord easily offers, readily offers. That's for us Christians. And now, if you're here today and you don't consider yourself a religious person, 
And you might say, yeah, religion is really not my thing. So thanks, no thanks. I'm really not burdened or crushed by anything. I'm good. I'm fine. I got this. I'm the master of my own soul, the captain of my own soul. Well, I'd encourage you to think again, I guess. I would not even have to live with the point or to illustrate how crushing a burden it is to vie for acceptance or to live for the approval of others. Be it your boss, your parents, your friends, your children, your husband, name it. You know it. And it's a terrible way to live just to meet someone else's expectation. Yet we humans tend to do all sorts of things just so that we can live up to standards. The feeling of not measuring up is just awful. It creates a lingering dissonance in our hearts and in our minds. It just doesn't resolve. It just doesn't go away. A New York Times author, a New York Times author calls this the eternal murmur. The et- eternal inner murmur of self-reproach or the machinery of self-censorship. I personally know this as that constant and nagging feeling, just a voice telling you, you're not good enough. You're not good enough. And this translates even to us Christians and virtually to everyone else. We just got to do something more. And so we pile up our works of self-righteousness. We anxiously toil so that we can feel better about ourselves. We beat up ourselves to do better, and we might do a good job until a certain point, but we'll eventually fail. We will eventually fail, and then, again, we're driven back to despair. And on and on goes the vicious cycle of works-based repentance and striving, fleeting success, and then eventual failure, then back to despair. If in any way you identify with I'm what I'm saying, then Christ's invitation is for you. It's for us indeed. Jesus is telling us to come. He alone has the power and the heart to free us from our anxious toil of religiosity. He alone can silence the eternal inner murmur of self-reproach and give us rest. So are you weary? Are you heavy laden? You're invited. Come. Come to Christ. Come to rest in Christ. And this brings us to our second point. What are we being invited to? Christ is inviting us to rest. And this rest doesn't just mean physical rest. He means more. Rest for our souls. We'll divide this point into two sub-points where we will talk about the rest in Christ. The rest that Jesus gives, that passive rest which we receive from him as a gift. And we will talk about the yoke of Christ, his invitation for us to follow him, and that becomes our active resting in him. So first let's talk about the rest that Christ offers, the rest that Jesus gives. Jesus says in verse 28, I will give you rest. And again in verse 29, you will find rest for your souls. When you think of rest, what comes to your mind first? Probably most of us think rest is just stopping from any activity, just doing nothing. That's rest. For some of us, we think of rest as time with family. For others, hanging out with friends. Some people equate rest with doing recreational activities like watching movies, go watch Barbie, go watch Oppenheimer. Um, or for some of us, because we're in Malaysia, you have to go mamak, you go, go a food trip. While others find rest in doing physical activities like running, hiking, biking. I, I don't relate to that. I just want to stay at home and you know, sleep. And that's rest for me. You see, there's a variety of definitions and interpretations that we, can, we have for rest. But what kind of rest is Jesus promising? It's not merely physical rest, peace of mind, or relief for, from our daily burdens. Well, the rest that he offers does not 
exclude those. But it's more than those things. It transcends those things. What Jesus is offering here is soul rest. The ultimate rest one soul can ever have. It's what Tim Keller called the REM sleep for the soul. In terms of physical sleep, we know that there's what scientists call the rapid, rapid eye movement sleep, you know? The kind of sleep that we need, that our bodies need so that we can be refreshed. And Jesus says, there's an REM for the soul. And I'm giving it to you. It's a kind of rest that shuts down the machinery of self-reproach and hushes the eternal inner murmur of our souls. That's what he's offering. And to get a better grasp of what this kind of rest is that Christ is promising, let's try to peer a little bit into Christ's own understanding and theology of, of himself as the rest giver. Now, I'm not a theologian, so bear with me. But through his words in Matthew 11, I'd say Jesus is being very careful in his choice of words. By calling the weary and burdened to himself and inviting them to come and take his yoke, and then, as a result, promising rest for the souls, Jesus is quoting directly from Jeremiah 6, verse 16. Thus says the Lord, Stand by the roads and look, and ask for the ancient paths where the good way is, and walk in it, and find rest for your souls. What is he saying here? Jesus is making an astounding claim by inviting people to come to him and then offering rest for your souls instead of calling them to the ancient paths or to the good way, which otherwise um, can be understood as, you know, the law and the prophet, what the prophets are calling the people of Israel back in the Old Testament. No, no, Jesus doesn't call his uh, audience back to the law, but unto himself, and then he offers rest. In other words, Jesus is presenting himself as the very fulfillment of whatever the prophets and the law was pointing to. He is the ultimate rest giver, and he gives true soul rest. Now, going back to the book of Matthew, we know that it's filled with Old Testament references, driving the very same point that Jesus indeed is that long-awaited Messiah. Matthew 11 alone is filled with allusions and direct quotations from the Old Testament, pointing to the same fact. And I wish I had both the time and the technical skill to exhibit these connections this morning. However, let's maybe try one. In the immediate context of Matthew 11, we will find another confirmation coming from the mouth of Jesus himself, as recorded by Matthew, that he is indeed the Messiah. In verse 3, the disciples of John the Baptist came to ask Jesus as they were sent by, by John himself. And they asked, are you the one who is to come? Or shall we look for another? And Jesus answered them in a language very reminiscent of many Old Testament passages. But particularly in Isaiah 61, verse 1 to 2, which he talks about the Jubilee, which talks about the Jubilee or the year of the Lord's favor. The good news that uh, the poor can be, and, and the captives can be freed. In light of our passage this morning, in essence, Jesus is revealing to little children, to the humble, to the lowly, to the poor, and to the oppressed, I am your Messiah. I am the Lord's anointed. Come to me and learn from me and you will find rest for your souls. The rest which Jesus Christ offers is the ultimate rest to which all the ideas of rest in the Old Testament climaxes to. 
The future rest which David was referring to, as Andy preached to us in Psalm 95. And the Sabbath rest that remains for the people of God in Hebrews 4. We can find it in Christ. And it's the kind of rest that he's offering. And as Andy preached to us last week, this rest has been won and paid for by Christ. It is finished. It is done. We can just come to him on the basis of Christ's finished work. The ticket is paid for. Christ paid for it himself. Today, Jesus is calling us to come find rest in him. But as we already pointed out, resting in Christ is not just a passive thing. There is an active dimension to it. And this brings us to our next sub-point. As Hebrews 4.11 exhorts us, let us strive, therefore, to enter that rest. And so we talk about the active dimension of it. What are we being invited to? We're being invited to take his yoke upon us. To take my yoke, Jesus says, and learn from me. And by doing so, find rest for your souls. Earlier, we tried to define rest in general, and we listed a bunch of activities, right, um, which, which equates to resting. So maybe the idea of rest and as, activity, as an activity is not so, so foreign to us anymore. Um, and here, Jesus is calling us to, to take his yoke upon us. How many of us have has seen a yoke? Have you ever seen a yoke? Yeah, it, it's not the yellow part of the egg, right? It's not. Um, but it's the wooden tool that's being put on to, to, to animals so that they can pull heavy loads. Imagine with me this um, funny il- illustration for a little bit to see how the yoke works. Um, imagine with me I'm a, if, if I'm going to be like a poor medium-sized oxen pulling a heavy load. And then yoked with me is my little baby oxen, Caris. And we're both pulling a load together. Guess who's carrying the heavy weight? Is it Caris? <laughs> it's definitely not Caris. It's me, right? But let's change it up a little bit. Say, I'm still carrying the yoke, but yoked with me is Jordan right here. <laughs> then who's carrying the heavy load? Jordan. I get, you, get, you get the idea. But hey, look at it this way. Just think of how much lighter the yoke and the load will be if I am yoked with Christ. If you are yoked with Christ. And he's all-powerful. Now going back to the text, let's consider what Christ's mean by his yoke, because he is inviting us to take my yoke upon you. The yoke in view here is the yoke of submission to Jesus. Jesus is using the metaphor of a yoke to invite people to submit to him and to his teaching. It's common in the Jewish tradition um, to refer to the yoke of submission to the Torah or to the law. But by inviting people to take his yoke and learn from him, uh, Jesus is calling people to his discipleship. He's calling us to submit to his authority, to submit to his teaching. Jesus is inviting those little children to come in humility and to trust his word. Trust his divine revelation. In Matthew 11, verse 27, Jesus said, No one knows the Son except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son. And anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. And only by submitting to Christ's teaching and revelation of himself, and therefore, 
his revelation of the Father. It's only through submitting to these truths that we can enjoy a relationship with him and with the Father. By inviting us, or by, by calling us to take his yoke, Jesus invites, his, invites us to his discipleship. He's inviting us to a scholarship, which he is both the teacher and he's also the subject. And oh, what a life-giving teacher and what a glorious subject matter he is. We can spend the whole of our lives learning of him and the glories and his glories in the gospel. And it will not be enough for us just to fully comprehend his glorious person and work. One commentator said that these words that Jesus is speaking is self-authenticating words. It doesn't need proving, actually. And I invite you to just come, come to Christ and see for yourself. But I would say, if we take Jesus and his teaching, the main authority of our lives, what joy would it bring us? Despite and in spite of all the hardships that this life may bring. You see, taking Jesus' yoke and submitting to him, to his teaching, gives relief to the soul. In contrast to submitting to the Pharisees' legalistic interpretation of the law, which becomes a crushing burden. In Matthew 23, verse 4, Jesus announced and, and pronounced his woes to the Pharisees. And he said, They tie up heavy burdens hard to bear, and they lay them on people's shoulder, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. But Jesus, in contrast to the Pharisees, he's not like that. He's not unwilling to. He's not putting burdens to us. It's not going to put a burden and a yoke to you and not being willing to lift a finger. He says, his yoke is easy and his burden is light. By saying his yoke is easy though and his burden is light, Jesus doesn't mean that the Christian life will be just like a walk in the park. It's just, I wish it can be like that, but it's not like that. There's work to be done. There's real burden that comes to fo with following him. And Jesus himself thought that his followers have a cross to carry. He didn't promise a trial-free life. Instead, he promised tribulation to his disciples. But this warning didn't come without any encouragement. He said, take heart, for he has overcome the world. Hence, John, in his first letter, can say that his commandments are not burdensome. His yoke is easy indeed. How is his yoke easy? How can his burden be light? The short answer is, he carries it for us. He's done all the work. We will expound this answer by looking at what kind of Lord and Savior he is. This leads us to our last point where we will consider the heart of Christ in his person and in his work. So considering Jesus' invitation for us to come, we've been asking who's invited? What are we being invited to? So who's invited? Those who labor and are heavy laden. What is he inviting us to? He's inviting us to find rest in him, both actively and passively? Next question is, how can we come? How can we come? Short answer again. Just come. Stop asking questions. Just come. Away with your doubt, away with your hesitations. Just come. No prerequisites, no caveats whatsoever. Well, actually the warning or the caveats apply to those who would not come, to those who would reject his invitation. 
We'll touch on that a little bit later. But if you would come, just come. Come and see. Come and learn of him. Come in repentance and faith. Then you will find rest for your souls. Why? Jesus says, For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Imagine if you received a dinner invitation from a very prominent person, say the King of England, dinner at Buckingham Palace. Uh, for sure, there will be some kind of intimidation or feeling of unworthiness that, that comes with that kind of, with receiving that invitation, right? You might ask all sorts of questions like, why me? How can I come? What would I wear? What should I bring? What am I going to do? You might even say, well, it's just too good to be true. This can't be. Can I, can I decline? But if you would decline, how dare I decline this kind of invitation from, from this monarch? But what if I tell you that the king of kings himself, the God of the universe, the son of God, one with the Father, the very God of God, is the one here calling himself gentle and lowly, and he's the one inviting us. Well, how do you know that, you ask? Well, in Matthew 11, 27, again, we quoted this earlier. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Immediately following this verse 27 is, you guessed it, verse 28. Um, and it's, it's what we've been talking about where Jesus invites us to come. The gentle and lowly Messiah is also the high and exalted Lord. He is the one revealing himself to us in these verses. And he's the one who has and who alone can reveal the Father to us. And oh, I pray that he does so this morning and to many of us who has not yet come so that you may find rest for your souls. Understanding this brings much more weight to the invitation that we've been considering in this passage. No less than the God of the universe and the person of Jesus Christ is inviting you to come find rest in him. Jesus, the Son of God himself, is revealing himself to us as a gentle and lowly Savior, opening his heart to us, inviting us to come. What great danger it is for someone to neglect this great salvation or this invitation. In fact, if we read in verses 20 to 24 of Matthew 11, where Jesus pronounced woes to unrepentant cities who would not humble themselves in response to his life and ministry, in response to his call of repentance, we would see that there's judgment to, to those who wouldn't come. Yes, Jesus is gentle and lowly, but he doesn't mean he's soft and mushy. This is what I meant earlier when I said, the warning applies to those who doesn't come or who would not come. But to those who would come in childlike faith, he would warmly welcome. Whoever comes to me, I will never cast out, he says in John 6, verse 37. And gentle and lowly here means he is accessible, as, as Dane Ortland helped us to understand in, if, if you've read the book Gentle and Lowly. It means he is meek and he is approachable. And I guess it's, we can say that we can observe it the, way, the very way Jesus acted and lived in his very person and in his very life as we read in the Gospels and throughout the pages of Scriptures. How meek and gentle he is. Though he was in the form of God, 
he emptied himself of his glory, taking the form of a servant. Being born as man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Philippians 2, verse 6 to 8. He came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Matthew 20, verse 28. He came to take the burden of sin and judgment in that wooden cross. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. 1 Peter 2, verse 24. We have so great an invitation from such a great Savior. And the question is, why don't we just come to Him? What's keeping you? What's keeping us from coming to Christ? What's keeping you from resting in His finished work? Are you weary and burdened with your actively working out your self-righteousness? Are you just tired of works-based repentance? Jesus Christ himself has fulfilled all the requirements of the law. He has lived a perfect life in obedience and in submission to the law of God. So that as we put our faith in him and his finished work on the cross, he would clothe us with his righteousness, a real one not a manufactured one, not a filthy rag. He takes away the filthy rags of our self-righteousness and gives his own. Are you crushed down by the weight of your sins and guilt? Christ on the cross has borne your grief and carried your sorrow. He was pierced for your transgression, crushed for your iniquities, he received the chastisement that brought us peace with God. You don't have to beat yourself up. He has taken all the beating for you. He's taking all, taken all the beating for us. In the cross, he bore the anguish of the wrath of God so that we can receive the love of God and thereby be called children of God. Are you weary and burdened from actively striving for acceptance? Christ was rejected by men, abandoned by his followers, and at the greatest time of his anguish on the cross, as he was bearing all our sins, he cried to the Father, Why have you forsaken me? He was forsaken so that we can be accepted in Christ, we have been adopted as the children of God. Now we can come and call God as Jesus calls him. Abba, Father. Jesus rose again and he has given us his spirit that allows us to do so. So come, lay your active labor and your burdens at the feet of the cross and find your soul's rest in him. Come and take his yoke and learn of him. Follow him. Keep finding rest in him. Rest in his gentle and lowly heart. Come without money. Come without merit. Come to Jesus. See him on the cross. See the anguish that brought you peace. See the price that he had to pay. And may we come to him as the hymn goes. Not the labors of my hands can fulfill thy law's demands. Could my zeal no respite know? Could my tears forever flow? All could never sin erase. Thou must save and save by grace. May this be the song of our hearts. Nothing in my hands I bring. Simply to the cross I cling.
we can taste the reality of the future promise of eternal rest in its fulfillment in the person and work of Christ. He is inviting us to experience its reality today. He is calling you. He is inviting you. Would you come? Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Through the work of our Lord, we can come to you and call you Father. We thank you for Christ living a perfect life, living righteously in accordance to your word, fulfilling all its demand. Thank you for sending him to die on the cross so that we can be reconciled with you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your work. We thank you for all that you are for us. Forgive us, oh Lord, for the many times that we live as if we can gain your approval for living for acceptance of others. Lord, would you grant soul rest to the weary, to the heavy laden. And may we never, ever lose sight of our position as your child, your children, because of what our Lord has done. And may we rest in that reality as we look forward to the ultimate fulfillment of this rest, may we experience the reality of it today and every day in our lives. For it's in your name, our Lord, we pray. Amen.